The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, Good evening everyone. This Steve is Steve Nelson, Nelson president, president of the Nebraska Farm Bureau, Bureau and welcoming you again to another, to another issue, issue update, update webinar. webinar. I hope, I hope we that we find everyone well this evening, well this evening. and I know, I know that, that uh, a lot of us have had rain over the, the last week or so, and that's been very helpful, but I know that we I have a long ways to go and that we need we'll need a lot more rain as the season goes. I I traveled uh, home a week ago and no one was in the field. The ground was wet. I traveled home again this this Saturday and again no one was in the field and uh, today when I came back or this afternoon I didn't see a tractor uh, moving either. So pretty unusual I think for this time of year but certainly very good that we are getting some moisture. I want to just take a moment too to, to uh, ask everyone to remember in your prayers the issues that are going on in Boston and to keep those that uh, have been injured in your prayers and the families of those that, that have died in your prayers as well and uh, continue to, to uh, keep that, that in our minds. Uh, we also, I understand, have uh, county farm bureaus from Frontier, Hall, Pawnee, Knox, and possibly Wayne County on, and so very glad to have uh, have uh, those boards on as well. And so uh, I hope that this goes good for you, and and I look forward to uh, being able to provide a lot of information this evening and uh, and uh, answering your questions as well. So at this time, I'll turn turn the webinar over to Jay Ferris and he will update you on some of the details of how the webinar, webinar will proceed and, and then, then we will go, go uh, get, get on with the update. update. So, so I thank, I thank you again and I will be back, back on with you when we're ready to finish up. Okay, thank you Steve. We uh, are um, Getting ready for our next or for this webinar, uh, Jordan is going to start us off. But I just wanted, uh, for most of you that have been on these webinars with us before, you should know the procedures now. But a few of you are new, so uh, if you at any time you have a question during the webinar, there is a couple ways you can ask a question. First of all, there is an icon that looks like a little hand. If you click on that hand, you've essentially raised your hand. I can unmute your microphone. If you're either calling in on telephone, uh, it'll allow you to ask the question. We'll be able to hear it here and answer that. There's also, uh, in your control panel, there is a question box, and you can type in your question to that. I will see that, and I can ask the presenter that question then. So um, that's pretty self-explanatory. There's also a chat function that you can uh, enter something in the chat if you have a question personally for me that I can answer it back to you. If it's a procedural question, we can do that that way as well, too. Um, without further ado, I think we're going to let Jordan, who is doing this from his home this evening. So, Jordan, you're on. Thanks a lot, Jay. Um, I want to start in, again, as we've started these in the past, and I was going through the attendance list, and I can see that a lot of folks on here are the similar ones that we've had in the past, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on the basics of of uh, this particular oh, it's, there we go of this uh, of this regulation on the SPCC regulation I, I again like I said I, I think we had a lot of folks that have uh, that have seen that have seen the rules they know I'll just quickly go through it again um, if you have uh, tier one a fuel fuel storage capacity um, with a reasonable expectation of that spill going into a water of the US of 1320 to 10,000 gallons. If you have above ground fuel storage capacity 1320 to 10,000 down to a 55 gallon container, you need to have a tier one um, plan. You can self certify that plan, um, and those templates are available online. And secondary containment, again, would be a part of that, uh, would need to be a part of that SPCC plan. Tier two is anything above 10,000 gallons with a reasonable expectation that that spill goes into a water of the US again again down to a 55 gallon container. If you fit within tier two, um, you must uh, certify that plan with a licensed engineer. Now the part that I know that we have had some confusion on um, has been the new, uh, has been the enforcement date. When do you actually need to come into compliance with the SPC 
UCC rules. And again, I, I kind of breeze through those real quick. If folks have questions about the rule basics, I can certainly um, answer those questions. If, if you do have them, feel free to, as Jay said, raise your hand or, or just, uh, just ask them. Um, uh, type them in, uh, but uh, I wanted to skip over them just a little bit just because of the, the similarities we've had for the past calls. But the enforcement date is the big question that uh, we have gotten. Um, the original compliance deadline was May 10th of 2013. That's the one that you've seen time and time again. Everyone brings up, when you look at EPA, you look at the publications that have been sent out lately, um, they all talk about this May 10th compliance deadline. However, as a part of the CR, which just passed a couple weeks ago to fund the federal government through the rest of the fiscal year, the enforcement date has backed up to October 1st, 2013. If you go to EPA's website, they still show the deadline, the original compliance deadline of May 10th, 2013. And the reason they still have that, and the reason if you ask them, they'll tell you you need to be in compliance by then, is because that's their compliance deadline. The enforcement deadline is what the, is what the CR changed. Now, will the EPA come back at you if they see that your plan uh, is, uh, is uh, say, you, you got your plan done in June versus May? I don't think they will. I can't, I can't answer that with 100% certainty. Um, but, uh, but EPA continues to stand by the original compliance deadline um, just because they're talking compliance and we're talking when it comes to the actual uh, rule and when EPA can enforce it. That's the enforcement deadline, the beginning of October of, uh, of uh, this year. Now, it also is important to note that EPA talks about um, the, uh, the uh, compliance side of things that compliance deadline of May 10th is technically only for farms that have been in existence uh, after 2002. Um, most, folks, most folks don't know that, and we haven't been overly clear talking about that. But technically, that uh, compliance deadline for the May 10th, 2013, is for farms that have been in existence um, after, uh, up, up to, or well, basically at or after 2002. Any farm that was in existence prior needed to be in, in compliance immediately. Uh, again, EPA hasn't come after folks, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's kind of where we've been at uh, on the SPCC rule. One of the main reasons I want to skip over the, the rule basics a little faster is because I think we need to focus in on what Farm Bureau is going to do is we're kind of changing our, our uh, uh, focus a little bit. We've talked a lot about the compliance part of things. We've talked a lot about what you need to do, but we think it's time uh, to really focus in on um, what we can do to try to fix it. Because quite frankly, the questions that we've been, we've been getting from producers and the questions that uh, farmers and ranchers have had for EPA have largely gone unanswered. Uh, a lot of specifics they have not been overly clear about. Uh, for example, the, what is a reasonable expectation of a spill going into a water of the US? That, that has not been answered very clearly. And so what we would like to do is try to get this particular piece of legislation passed, and that's called the Farmers Undertake Environmental Land Stewardship Act. Again, Congress is always uh, good about naming legislation, uh, but we're just calling it the Fuels Act. That, that's what it's called, the Fuels Act. And for the past few years, we've been working on this particular piece of legislation to try to get it passed to adjust the SPCC standard. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking compliance, but we think the focus really needs to shift and we need to start talking more about what we can do again to try to get this particular piece of legislation um, uh, fixed. And I, uh, I uh, will stop right there real quick because I think I have a, a question about um, the rule itself. And so I'll be more than willing to answer that question here first before we skip over the legislation. Go ahead, yeah, Jay. That is correct. Um, this question was on Tier 2. Does it um, tie into underground tanks, or is it just for above ground storage, or is it's it? It's just above ground. Okay. It's just above ground. Okay. There are there are uh, there are you need to have there are certain SPCC rules that deal with below ground, um, and I think that number is at forty two thousand. But yet you know, I'd have to double check again. Um, and uh, and so below but, uh, underground storage is is a separate. It's it's separate. Um, and, uh, and I'd also say we've been spending a lot of time talking about how uh, mobile tanks do not count as part of um, the, uh, the uh, capacity, the, the, 
it doesn't count for your 1320 to 10,000 or above 10,000. However, I was talking to my counterpart in Iowa uh, just last week, and she had been told the exact opposite from EPA, even though EPA Region 7 has uh, said the exact opposite to us. So there is just there is massive confusion out there, and EPA changes their story every other week, uh, and so that's again why we're focusing on on the Fuels Act. Uh, this particular piece of legislation was was introduced in both the House and the Senate. Um, you can see the Senate and House bills on there right now. Uh, and essentially, what the bill would do is uh, is create some some simplicity in our in our eyes. Basically, Tier One would be changed uh, from 1320 to 10,000 gallons. It would now be 10,000 to 42,000 before you'd have to um, have a self-certified SPCC plan. Tier Two. Uh, where you'd have to have an engineer certified plan would be any amount above 42,000 gallons. Again, this does not, uh, it does not pull everyone out, and, and we understand that. It doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, <clears throat> it, it doesn't fix the problem completely. But in our opinion, this does the best job we can, and it's, I think, politically um, the, best, uh, the best deal we can get in terms of trying to um, get this thing fixed. And so what, what, uh, what can you do? What have we been asking people to do? And basically what we would like you to do is go onto the Nebraska Farm Bureau website if you've not done so already. We have issued an action alert uh, to try to get the, our congressional delegation to move forward with this particular piece of legislation. Um, if, you, uh, if you go to the www.nefb.org website, you click on the Take Action button, and it'll, send, you'll, it'll pop up letters that we can send letters to. It'll pop up these letters to send to the Nebraska Congressional Delegation. Congressman Fortenberry is the, one, is the lone uh, member of our delegation who has not co-sponsored the bill. Um, Congressman Smith, Congressman Terry have co-sponsored in the House. Senator Fisher and Senator Johans have co-sponsored in the Senate. Congressman Fortenberry has supported this legislation in the past. It passed the House last year, um, and he did support it then. Uh, and Congressman Fortenberry has been willing to work with us on a couple other things uh, dealing with this issue. I, I don't think that um, his lack of co-sponsorship is, is because he doesn't support it. Um, we, uh, we've been in talks with him uh, over the past couple weeks to try to get him on the bill, and I think uh, there's some effort to try to do that. But uh, um, <clears throat> these letters are, you know, again, we have our delegation with us, but that doesn't mean we just leave them alone. They need to know that this is the issue. And I'll tell you folks, as I continue to get phone call after phone call after phone call, um, it's pretty clear that this is the issue. Um, and, uh, and I will tell you that uh, the reason we ask folks uh, to send letters uh, to, to congressional representatives who may already agree with this is because they can use that as ammunition. And I know we talk a lot about the ability uh, for that congressman, that senator, to take that communication to their colleague and show them, hey, I've got a constituent, I've got a group of constituents that's concerned about this issue. And I know that a lot of folks can say, well, that doesn't happen. Well, last week, during the confirmation hearing of the new EPA administrator, uh, Gina McCarthy, um, during her questioning, Senator Fisher pulled up an email that her office received from a Farm Bureau member. And that letter detailed, and it, it might be someone on the call, actually. I, I, don't, uh, I don't know who it is yet. Um, but uh, it basically detailed the problems they were going through trying to get any standard inf basic, basic information on the rule. This farmer said that they had uh, first heard about the SPCC rule through us here at Farm Bureau. Um, and they called the uh, EPA office in D.C. They did not get anywhere. <clears throat> they said to call uh, EPA Region 7. He called Region 7, and uh, Region 7 sent him to a, uh, an engineering uh, association. That association sent him to another number, which that number was disconnected. Uh, and so it's this, it's this lack of, of clarity. That's why we're supporting this piece of legislation. But going back to my original point, Senator Fisher brought up and read that entire email to Gina McCarthy, the new EPA administrator, and said, you know, what can we do? about this rule. What can we do to fix it? Because this is unacceptable. Um, and so we, uh, that's, that's why we ask you to do these things. Even when we've got folks that are on our side, they can use that information. They can use those emails uh, to try to get some of this, uh, this legislation passed. When you've got stories like that, um, it makes our jobs a lot easier because they can show, hey, 
this is really a problem. This isn't just a group of form letters coming out. This is a real issue. Uh, people are having a real hard time with this, and we need to fix it. Uh, and so if you have not done so yet, please, please go on to the Farm Bureau website, take action on this issue, send the letters to Congressman Fortenberry, Congressman Terry, Congressman Smith, and Senator Johansson, Senator Fisher, um, and tell them that, uh, you know, we're with them, and, and let's get this piece of legislation passed. So um, any questions on this legislation, um, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them, too, as we move forward. Um, I want to talk about budget again, and I know I've, I've talked about some of this stuff in the past, and so I, I kind of, I've done some changes, as you can see, some updating for the folks that have been on the call. Um, we, uh, we still had the continuing resolution, which passed um, kind of starting out, and uh, that passed a couple weeks ago. It provided federal funding for federal meat inspectors, uh, and so the, uh, the furlough that was being talked about was, uh, was halted. That did not happen. Um, that enforcement delay with SPCC rules happened. Uh, and there was also something that uh, I think have, has been out in the media a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, the, the folks, uh, the environmental activists have started calling it the Monsanto Protection Act. Um, and, uh, you know, it completely misrepresents what this issue is. Um, one of the provisions within the CR allowed farmers to continue to plant a, uh, a pre, uh, an already approved GMO trait uh, uh, if, uh, if there was a court challenge by an environmental activist. This goes back to Roundup Ready sugar beets. Um, basically, a couple years ago, um, Roundup Ready sugar beets were adopted by ni over 98% of the sugar beet industry. Um, they, uh, that trait was approved for use by USDA. All of a sudden, some environmentalists sued, uh, and a judge in California wanted to destroy all Roundup Ready sugar beet seed and prevent it from being planted. Well, if you can imagine, if you have that much in the way of, uh, of uh, implementation of, of a genetically modified trade into the industry, as much as what uh, Roundup Ready sugar beets were, uh, there wasn't a lot of other seed out there. And so we were looking at the possibility of, of sugar shortages. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, this, all this provision does is allows a farmer to continue to plant a, a product with a GMO trait that has already been approved. It's not new traits. It's anything that has already been approved that's simply being challenged in court by environmental activists who don't like GMOs anyway. Uh, and so that was an important provision that, uh, that does uh, expire at the end of the fiscal year. But uh, we're going to try to get that in there uh, and work through it uh, as best as we can. Um, I want to hit on the Senate budget as well. Uh, the FY2, the, the, the 2014 budget that they passed, some important amendments uh, that were passed as a part of that. Um, unfortunately, a GMO fish labeling uh, amendment passed as a part of the, the Senate budget. We have not been supportive of GMO labeling to begin with, and this one would label a GMO fish. Um, we, we were uh, upset that this one passed, but it did make it through. Uh, the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, I think it's uh, very telling. Uh, there was language in there that essentially supported the pipeline. It passed 62 to 37. That's a big vote. Of, that's a big um, positive uh, push for the Keystone XL pipeline. Whether folks uh, support it or not, that's one thing. Um, but uh, that, that was a pretty large statement when the Senate uh, made, that, uh, made that vote. Uh, there was important uh, health care reform uh, amendments that were also passed, including uh, the, uh, the flex spending accounts and health savings accounts. There were caps that were implemented under the uh, health care reform law. Um, Senator Johans introduced an amendment to strike those caps, and that those those amendments passed. Um, that was a big statement again that uh, they're, they're, that the Senate is willing uh, to make some changes to health care reform. Uh, there were also some farm bill decisions made, and it was uh, basically a funding uh, decision. When you look at what they tried to do, they gave uh, the Senate um, the uh, the kind of a, a budget uh, uh, example of how much money they need to spend. And that number, again, uh, the, uh, the Senate folks want uh, the Senate Farm Bill negotiators to trim roughly $23 billion from farm spending, the same as what they tried to do uh, last year. So um, the Senate budget, as well as the House budget, will probably not go anywhere. We're probably looking at another continuing resolution at the end of, uh, at the end of this fiscal year. It just seems to be the way Congress operates anymore. Um, but uh, those were state 
statements, none of those things that I just mentioned actually became law. They just they just passed. They're more message votes than anything else. Um, but it shows a, a clear uh, a clear opinion of the Senate when you have votes that take place like that. One of the things that was introduced last week that I do want to hit on is the president's budget. Again, this budget probably won't go anywhere, but it's it's political. It lays out what the president's agenda is and some things that we uh, that we're looking into. Um, you know, the president again had a very large budget deficit, as all budgets uh, in this country have been for the past couple of years. A 744 billion dollar deficit in this budget. Uh, 7.4 billion dollars in cuts to federal crop insurance by some changes here or there, some subsidy limits here or there uh, on a couple of different uh, parts of federal crop insurance. A pretty significant cut, in our opinion. Um, this was not uh, this was not administrative cuts. This was purely on the subsidy that you all received. That's where. Um, the, these cuts came from. Uh, the president cut direct payments completely uh, out of this budget. Uh, there were some conservation cl cuts including EQIP at 400 million CSP uh, to a, uh, basically they capped the acreage level uh, and so there was a monetary cut there. Uh, CRP, they basically did the same thing. The president did the same thing, a reduction of 7 million acres. That's what the uh, House and Senate both did in their 2012 Farm Bill proposals. Uh, also important to note, the president cut funding for the inspection of horse slaughter facilities. Um, that is, that's a very big uh, political uh, statement right there, that the president is siding with HSUS um, on this particular provision. Uh, we have been supportive of keeping that funding uh, out there. Uh, we've been trying to, we finally were able to get that funding reinstated after it was cut a couple of years ago. If you all remember, the, the uh, funding was cut. Uh, there is not a ban on horse slaughter in this country. They just didn't have, they just took away the funding to inspect the plants. Uh, and so we got that funding implemented again. They're trying to get those horse slaughter plants up and running. The president uh, tried to cut funding, tried to uh, basically take all the funding away from the inspection of horse slaughter facilities. Um, and then lastly, the president also made substantial changes to the federal, uh, to the foreign aid, foreign food aid uh, uh, program that USDA operates. Basically, the way that works is if we provide food aid to a country, we use U.S. products in order to um, meet those that, that country's needs. Um, the president, uh, in an effort, uh, very uh, right-wing conservatives uh, also support this move because um, uh, it saves a lot of money. But they would use. Uh, uh, a lot of food, they would take away um, the, the U.S., uh, a larger part of the U.S. portion of that food, and they would try to purchase food in other countries to try to meet those, uh, meet those, uh, that foreign food aid uh, uh, that they offer other countries. And so they would they'd essentially buy the food from the country in which, uh, or a nearby country, uh, to try to save money. Uh, if you're just trying to save money, that's what that does, in our opinion. Um, you know the reason we offer food aid to other countries is to help them out, um, and uh, and uh, having that food come from U.S. farmers uh, is important. If the federal government is providing food for other countries, having that that food come from uh, the the U.S. farmers is an important part of that. We were we were uh, not supportive of those changes. Um, from uh, from uh, the president on his budget, so that's where we're at in terms of the budget. Are there any questions on on this particular section of the presentation? Uh, yeah, we do have one, and, and you may have answered this question already, Jordan. But it was on, it's on foreign food aid changes, okay. and it doesn't look like the changes are going to be in effect, or will that change? No, they essentially so. The president's budget, the Senate's budget, the House budget, all of this comes together, and, and they're, really, they're pretty much non-starters anywhere they go. Um, the president's budget made substantial cuts to, uh, or some, made cuts, excuse me, not substantial cuts, but made cuts to uh, Social Security. He made some cuts here or there to other programs that Democrats didn't like. He made a lot, cuts to a lot of programs and had a very large deficit that Republicans didn't like. And so it's a non-starter in both the House and the Senate. Um, it's uh, these things are, are just out there. They're thrown out there, and uh, and they're not uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Now, the fact that the president supported these things that doesn't mean they can't try to attach it to something in the future. Uh, but uh, in terms of this type of thing becoming law, um, the chances are are very very small. Um, and uh, you know the the cuts to crop insurance. 
uh, probably not going to happen. When you look at this new farm bill, crop insurance seems to be fairly safe as of right now. Um, not saying that it doesn't have its the target on its back, but it appears to be fairly safe. Um, the conservation cuts roughly the same as what we've had in the past farm bill proposals. Um, horse slaughter, it'll be uh, that one will be tough because I know there's a lot of folks in the in the House as well as the Senate that would like to try to get that funding taken out again. We've been able to keep that in, and uh, hopefully we can continue to do so. So. Um, any other questions, Jay, on this one before I move forward? I'm not seeing any questions at this right. uh, time, but feel free, if anybody does have a question, to feel free to ask it. I've got uh, a couple other items real quick, and I want to talk about uh, American Farm Bureau released its 2013 Farm Bill proposal. Um, and I wanted to hit on it a little bit because it's a little different than what we talked about last year. Um, it's uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's going to take some, I think, getting used to for folks, but I think once you hear it, um, you'll understand it, and uh, I can explain a little bit more why American Farm Bureau came up with what they did. Um, but the plan, uh, basically what they did was they talked an awful lot about the, the actual crop time Title or Title I, um, and uh, and combined with crop insurance, and we're looking at a new three-legged stool approach. You've got the federal crop insurance program, you've got marketing loans, and then you've got the third leg, which is producers would have a choice between a new updated target price program or the new stacks program, uh, the stacked income protection plan, um, and. You know, a lot of folks have asked, "What is Stacks?" This was something that was developed in the 2012 Farm Bill for Cotton, and um, and Farm Bureau looked at the program. They saw that um, there were some budgetary needs, um, and so they made some adjustments to it. They made some changes to it, and <clears throat> they thought it would be a good plan for uh, essentially all commodities. And this new program would basically sit. It stacks. The, the name is Stacks. And the idea is that it sits on top of, or it's stacked on top of, the crop insurance you already have. It's a new income protection program that works with your crop insurance and allows farmers to buy up coverage <clears throat> for county level income losses of 10 to 25 percent. Um, basically, you you can purchase 90 percent crop insurance coverage. That that's basically what this what this is. It's similar to the supplemental coverage option that was discussed uh, last year. Um, it allows you to bump up your coverage, uh, and, and that uh, that bump up is subsidized at a higher level, at 70 percent. Um, you know, that's that's basically that that's the rundown of what it is. It's a new income. Uh, it's going to be run by it's going to be run by RMA, excuse me, um, and uh, and it's going to work with your federal crop insurance program. That's what it's going to be offered. That's one of your options. The other option, if you'd like to take it, is an updated target price program. This is meant more for um, the southern commodities. Um, but uh, you know that's they, they have this as an option. Prices would be established by taking the average price uh, for basically ten years, the market year average price from 2007 to 2011, and the CBO project, the Congressional Budget Office projected price from 2012 to 2017. They they come up with a number, and those numbers are what you see on the screen there: corn at 363, soybeans 821, wheat 540, rice 1290 or 93, and peanuts at 40. Uh, at 448.54. Uh, um, the big issue that we've had here uh, is that these target prices are considerably less on the southern commodity end of things than they were uh, under the last uh, farm bill, during the farm bill that we talked about last year, excuse me. Uh, the rice price was at about 15 bucks, uh, and so you can see that that's quite a bit less. They basically set the target price for rice rice and the the plans that passed the Senate and the or the plan that passed the House excuse me um, the Senate bill did not include a target price program but the House bill did and it was basically meant for rice and peanut producers and it set those those target prices above what the actual market price of those commodities were um, and AFBF's proposal um, taking those uh, those averages and coming up with those numbers those are uh, below, those are at or below what uh, the current market price for those commodities are uh, there's been some pushback from southern commodities on this proposal um, the uh, the adjustments made to the stacks program has not made the cotton folks very happy. Um, the adjustments made to the target price program has not made the rice folks overly happy or the peanut folks hap uh, that terribly happy. But uh, you know, we look at this as a way to uh, to save money. 
you look at it on the budget implications side, the Senate's bill, the 2012 proposal that they passed through the entire Senate last year, had an actual savings of $13 billion. They were supposed to come up with $23 billion, but they were $10 billion short. Um, they uh, they uh, thought they had 23. Um, the CBO updated their projection in February. They fell 10 billion short. They needed to come up with more money. The House they trimmed 31 billion. Uh, they trimmed quite a bit more, but a lot of that funding trim came from the uh, came from the nutrition side, which uh, would be harder to do in the House, significantly harder to do in the House. So, the American Farm Bureau proposal comes up with the 23 billion dollars in savings. That's what the Senate asked for. That's what we think we can get through, um, and uh, that's why we came up with the program we did. We saw the number that we needed to save. We came up with a program that we thought fits that number, but also um, works with folks as crop insurance, keeps crop insurance the focus, uh, and then allows us uh, some, in our opinion, decent protection at the same time. That's the American Farm Bureau, uh, a quick, just a quick rundown of the of the of their farm bill uh, proposal are there any questions uh, on the farm bill proposal before I move on to the next thing which will only take me just a couple seconds and I actually I might just skip over to that one right now Jay we'll just hang on one second and I'll talk to the next issue real quick because it'll take two seconds um, immigration reform there'll be a former there will be a negotiated plan unveiled tomorrow um, the Senate uh, Gang of Eight came together. Um, they've kind of got some things uh, put together. Uh, Farm Bureau has been uh, has been involved with these discussions from the very beginning, and they're working through. Our priorities have been continue to be a new ag guest worker program. The program will be run through USDA, but the contract term, how long those folks can stay in the country, is still being decided. It was it had not been a hundred percent laid out or agreed to. Um, this morning, um, I think the, they're leaning toward a three-year contract, but that's uh, that's where we're at on immigration. The thing will be in our, in, unveiled tomorrow. I'll have more. Uh, if folks uh, are interested in that, they can feel free to call me tomorrow afternoon, and I'll have a little bit more to say on that one. But stay tuned. Uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Are there any questions? That's it for me. Are there any questions about the Farm Bill proposal, immigration, or anything else that I covered so far? Any questions for Jordan? At this point, I am not seeing any, but uh, we'll give folks just a second or two if they want to. Okay, I'm not seeing any any questions at this point. For oh, we do have a question for you. This is coming in from Larry okay. Musak. I'm going to uh, unmute Larry's microphone. So, Larry, go ahead and ask your question. Larry has his hand raised. I don't know if his microphone is not working. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute Larry's back. Larry, if you do have a question, you can go ahead and text it in. Or, uh, But we do have another question. Um, it, will there be any cap? The cap on, on, on payments. Um, AFBS proposal does not have a cap on payments. It's one thing that I think we're going to have to, no matter what the program comes out with, and I, I will extend that not just to um, whatever uh, uh, Title I programs we come up with, but I'll also talk about with that with federal crop insurance. That will be a very big fight this year. Uh, trying to make sure that payment limits or caps uh, are not included in these proposals. Um, if you look at what was introduced last year um, during the amendment process, there were a couple amendments that dealt with caps on federal crop insurance. Um, the figures I saw, a, a large majority of farms um, that uh, had received crop insurance payments this year would have been subject to those caps. So um, our proposal does not have caps. But I think we're going to have to uh, we're going to have we're going to have that conversation. Um, we're going to, we're going to be forced to to try to defend uh, no caps uh, in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks as we move forward. Okay. Any other questions for Jordan? Not seeing any, so I think we will at this time uh, turn it over to Jay Rempe. And obviously, as we go on, Jordan, I think you're planning on uh, sticking around for just a little bit. I'll still be on. If anybody does have a question as we go through, and it 
is uh, one for Jordan. We will make sure he gets to answer that. So, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Jay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for participating tonight. It's uh, good to be here. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, run through some state issues, some things going on in, in front of your state legislature, uh, highlight some issues that uh, we at Farm Bureau have been working on, and, and then I'd be glad to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. Uh, let me start just trying to give a, a quick overview of where we're at in the session. Uh, Thursday was day 59 of the session. Uh, this year, as you probably know, is a 90-day session, which will end the first part of June. So the body is uh, just about two-thirds complete with this session. Uh, they come back tomorrow. They, they had a four-day weekend. They come back tomorrow to start day 60. And that will continue in the process. They uh, went into all day sessions about three weeks ago, and so they uh, they will spend most of the day on the floor debating issues. Uh, this speaker, Speaker Adams, has treated things a little differently this year. And, and typically, this time of the year, they'd be working to about 4:30 or 5. Now they're actually working 6, and some evenings 6:30. And then starting next week, they're going to start working even later on some evenings and 8 or 8:30 to try to get things done. Uh, as you know, senators and committees and the speaker will designate priority bills. Uh, the number of priority bills designated equals 102. Just if there, there's anything that would, uh, any word that would catch this session or describe this session in just one word, it would be slow. Uh, they are not moving very fast, right? The, a lot of priority bills are still in committee. There's 25 plus priority bills in committee. I don't know the number exactly that are still on the first round of debate in general file, but there are several uh, sig significant numbers still on general file. Uh, there's a couple reasons for their slowness this year. One of them is Senator Ernie Chambers, who uh, is back in the body from Omaha. He has uh, he has uh, jumped on a lot of different bills and uh, taken a lot of them, uh, filibustered them, and taken a lot of them eight hours to to get cloture votes on a lot of different bills. But uh, he isn't the only reason. Uh, there, there's a little more uh, politics, I guess, if you will, in the body this year for a variety of reasons. And so we have others that are participating in, in delaying uh, some things that they don't, they don't like too well. So, uh, so I, I say that just because even though these bills have been designated priority bills, there's a good, good chance that the body will not get to all the priority bills and even get done with them. Uh, some of the, they really have a lot of big issues yet that they have to deal with with this session. And uh, I've listed three of them there, the budget, state aid to schools, which I'll, I'll go into here in a little bit more on, a, on another slide, uh, the death penalty. Now that uh, Senator Chambers is back, uh, that's something he feels very strongly about. And, and uh, the, the bill did come out of committee, and it's been prioritized, so they'll definitely be talking about that. Uh, one I probably was remiss in, in not listing is the Medicaid issue. Uh, in fact, they're going to take up that tomorrow of whether the state should expand the Medicaid program under the, uh, the Health Care Act that was passed a couple years, two or three years ago by Congress. Uh, they're going to come back to that tomorrow, and the expectation is that they will spend two, if not more, maybe even three days debating, debating that issue. So. Uh, Really, the only thing they absolutely have to do that they're required to do by the Constitution is pass a budget. And the Appropriations Committee will has until day 70 of the session, so they have about just over 10 days to, uh, to issue their budget. They'll finish up mostly their work this week, and then it'll go to print, and they'll release it probably here in a couple weeks. Uh, once they get, uh, I guess once that, that budget comes out, Everything else will be set off to the side, and the body will work on the budget because they have date certains when they have to pass that and move forward. So there is a little window of opportunity now to, to get some things done prior to the budget, but once that comes out, that's what they'll focus on. And then depending how long that takes, we'll see, we'll see what they get to. I think for the first time in many, many years, as long as I can remember, the Appropriations Committee will likely not come out with a unanimous vote on their budget. And uh, I think that's just kind of a reflection, again, of, of the body this year and, and some of the politics that are involved. But uh, I would expect uh, maybe one or two, maybe even three senators on the committee to, to, uh, to not vote out the budget. And so that uh, will portend of a lot of discussion on the floor 
on, on the budget. From Farm Bureau standpoint in the budget, one of the key items for us is uh, funding, ongoing funding for water, which uh, as far as we hear, that's in there right now, plus uh, ongoing funding for the property tax credit program. Uh, that amounts to about $115 million a year, which uh, our understanding that is, that is in there as well. Um, let me run real quick now through uh, some of the issues that are out there that we're still working on. Let me start with uh, water funding. I mentioned that as part of the budget, that, uh, and that's part of uh, some bills. The ongoing funding in the budget uh, is reflective of some bills that have passed in, in previous sessions dealing with funding that required some general fund dollars. But even with that funding, there is a need for additional funding, and, and uh, senators have been wrestling with uh, trying to find a long-term uh, sustainable dedicated source for, for water funding. Uh, LB 517 is Senator Tom Carlson's bill that he prioritized. It was debated a couple weeks on the floor of the legislature and it advanced from general file to select file on a 36 to nothing vote. It would uh, create a 25 member task force and that task force's primary responsibility would be to develop a report by uh, the end of the year and uh, uh, to report back to the legislature and the governor. And basically what that report is to have is a, a road map of, uh, of, of the state's water funding needs all across the state. And it's supposed to take that, that road map and, and, uh, and, and look at four broad areas. Uh, one would be research data modeling, or data gathering and modeling. Uh, another would be conjunctive management of ground and surface water. Another would be infrastructure maintenance and, and new construction and development of infrastructure. And then uh, interstate compacts, com compliance, and uh, obligations with interstate agreements that we might have. And so they're supposed to take a look of all the projects, activities, and funding needs within these four broad areas and prioritize those needs within those areas and then kind of report back to, to the senators that, that priority, the roadmap of, of how those funding needs would, would move forward. And I guess the last part of the report is uh, they're supposed to develop a structure or a process, if you will, for uh, how those funds would be distributed, how do we decide where those funds go to, which gets funded first in the way of priorities and, and those kinds of things. They will not be addressing exactly where the money will come from that will be a decision of the legislature and the hope is or the, the expectation is that uh, this task force will come back with its reports, lay out these, uh, these funding needs, uh, it will lay out that road map for senators and then next year senators knowing where the money is going to go then will decide where to come up with those dollars. And so that will be the key question and that will be an issue that a lot of us will be working on on the interim is, is where do we come up with those dollars. There were some concerns expressed on general file. Uh, basically the, the concerns dealt with uh, who controlled the study and who controlled the appointments of the task force. Uh, the 25 member task force would be made up of 13 members of the Natural Resources Commission which already exists and then uh, 10, of the way the bill is drafted now, 10 appointees by the governor. So there's a lot of, and then three at large, or three um, at, uh, I'll call them at-large members, but I can't remember the term now, that, that uh, are there by virtue of their position. Uh, a lot of the discussion was whether the governor should have the, the role to appoint members or whether the legislature should take that prerogative. So there's some things like that to work out here between before it gets up on select file again. Uh, we're hoping uh, that it might get up later this week or the first part of next week on, on select file, but, but we will see. Uh, the next bill I'll touch on real quick is LB 637. Uh, this was introduced by Senator Wallman and uh, prioritized by Senator Wallman. And basically what it requires is an economic impact analysis to be performed by the Department of Environmental Quality. And that impact analysis would, would be required in two instances. One, if a proposed regulation is more stringent than a federal regulation that's required. And two, if a proposed regulation would increase the cost on a regulated in industry. And if that's the case, they're supposed to perform an economic impact analysis. They're supposed to reach out to the regulated industry and affected persons and get their input, look for uh, lower cost alternatives, and then uh, they're supposed to prepare a, a report uh, that would detail the economic impacts, the costs, 
the benefits expected out of the regulation, turn this over to the policy research office of the governor's staff. They would do the same thing, kind of take a look at it, and the whole idea is to come up with a, a, a regulation that addresses the need or, or gets to the benefit that's expected, but at a lower cost. Uh, that bill was uh, introduced by Senator Wallman on behalf of the ethanol industry because they've had some issues with uh, DEQ over some Clean Air Act issues. Uh, it was debated on uh, general file for a couple hours last week, but it didn't go any further. Senator Chambers has taken a keen interest in the bill, and if it comes back up, I'm sure he will push it for to go for the eight hours of debate. Um, Farm Bureau has been, uh, we testified in support of the bill. We have policy that supports an economic impact analysis on, on regulations before they're uh, imposed. And so we're supportive of it and trying to help out where we can. But uh, for the most part, the ethanol industry is taking the lead on this and, and trying to move forward. We have found in our research that there are a lot of other states that uh, have similar uh, requirements in place that not only apply to their DEQ, but apply to other agencies as well. But this one would just apply to the DEQ. Uh, who knows when we'll see this bill back up. Uh, given some of the other things that are that are going on, at the, it might be a little bit because uh, it, uh, of the time it will take on this bill. Uh, another bill that was up, uh, it was either early last week or the week before, I can't remember for sure, was LB57. It was introduced by Senator Larson, uh, Tyson Larson. And it gets at the Environmental Trust Fund and the Environmental Trust Board and some of the activities that were occurring there. There's a lot of concern starting to grow and, and be expressed with uh, the land acquisition activities by the Environmental Trust, particularly when those uh, a group will get a grant, grant dollars to purchase land or purchase a conservation easement and then turn around and sell that land or sell the easement to the federal government uh, a federal land management agency in that land is then taken off the tax rolls. Uh, there, this bill would require a couple things. It would, if in instances where grants are, are used to, and land is acquired with those trust funds or those grant funds, if uh, the land is to be uh, transferred to a federal agency, then they have to somehow uh, either the 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 person receiving the or the entity receiving the grant funds or somehow account for or try to set up a fund, a trust fund of some sort to pay for local property taxes that uh, that will, when that land gets transferred off to the uh, federal government and it gets taken off the tax rolls, they have to somehow account for that and make up for those local property taxes. And I know that's a big issue down in Clay County where we've seen a lot of grant per, uh, trust funds go, working with groups like Ducks Unlimited to for wetland preservation in that area and they're taking lands off the tax rolls. The other part of the bill is that would require the Environmental Trust Fund Board to approve any transfer of land that, that was originally acquired with trust fund dollars or grant funds. Uh, today, the what merely happens is if somebody wants to transfer that land, uh, they don't need the trust fund board approval, they just get the executive director of the environmental trust fund. So it would put uh, take uh, a couple changes, I guess, to the procedures of the environmental trust fund. That bill was very, very controversial uh, for whatever reason. When, when you touch any kind of operating procedures with the environmental trust fund, it raises a lot of, a lot of concerns with a lot of different groups and organizations. They spent eight hours debating this bill on general file, finally got enough votes to invoke cloture, got 34 votes to invoke cloture. Uh, it was amended several times. I thought there was a compromise reached, but then Senator Chambers jumped in the fray. Uh, there's more work that needs to be done on the bill. It, it did advance from general file to select file, uh, but it only got 27 votes. And so when you when you get 34 votes to invoke cloture, but you only get 27 votes to advance, that tells you there's a little bit of an issue there with the bill. And so I'm sure Senator Larson will be sitting around, sitting down with affected groups to uh, to try to go through go through the bill and, and, and improve it somewhat. Uh, let me also touch real quick on a bill, LB 362, that was debated for a little bit last week. It would uh, it was introduced by Senator Avery. It would uh, basically put a tax, new tax, or raise the registration fees on all motor vehicles in the state of seven dollars. Uh, there was an amendment offered to the bill that would have exempted uh, is a Natural Resources Committee amendment that would have exempted several different classes of vehicles, including farm vehicles. Uh, 
but uh, for personal vehicles and a lot of other vehicles that the, the fee would have stood. And the, the purpose would, would be to, to uh, invoke the fee or implement the fee, but then eliminate any park permits to go into uh, a tent or go to a game of parks, a, a state recreation area or a state park of some sort. And the idea was to try to raise more dollars for uh, parks and, and especially capital improvements and infra infrastructure in, in the state parks. Uh, the registration fee would have raised about $11 million. They think there's a backfall or back shortage of about uh, $45 million to $50 million that are needed for capital improvements in, in our state recreation areas and state parks. There's been a lot of opposition generated to the bill. Farm Bureau is part of a group of uh, state of state organizations that support highway funding that opposes the bill just because this would be the first time that we're using motor vehicle registration fees for something other than um, uh, funding roads. I, well, I shouldn't say the first time. There, the, there is some registration fees that go to fund public schools, but uh, this would be most of the registration fees and taxes paid on motor vehicles go to roads funding. And the fear is if we allow this kind of thing to start to happen, we'll see other instances where they try to tax motor vehicles to go other places rather than roads funding. And as you know, we, we continue to have a problem with roads funding in the state and more needs there, so we don't want to, to uh, divert other fundings. That bill was debated for a couple hours on general file. I Frankly, I don't expect it to come back up again because of the level of opposition to it. I think Senator Avery recognizes that there's a lot of opposition to it. He doesn't have the votes. It would take a major change in the bill to, uh, to see it start to move forward again. But uh, it was debated, debated last week, and it might be something to keep on the radar screen. Let me touch a little bit one of the more controversial issues that are going to, that's going to occur here the remainder of the session, and, and it all boils down to uh, to all, a lot of times every session, state aid to schools is one of the more controversial topics. And this year is not going to be any exception. Uh, one lobbyist that's working on this issue described it to me as it's going to be a bloodbath. <laughs> unfortunately, I, I think that's where we're headed on this issue. Um, it's LB 407 is introduced by Senator Kate Sullivan. It just came out of the Education Committee last week. It came out on a split vote. Five uh, vote, senators voted in favor of it. Uh, three voted against it. Uh, basically, it would uh, appropriate or distribute over $900 million of state aid, and this is state equalization aid. This is not does not include um, uh, income tax rebate monies that go to school or other category aids that go to school. This is the big chunk of state equalization aid, and it amounts to about $905 million. That's a 6% increase over uh, of this fiscal year, or about $53 million. Uh, just to give you an example where some of that money is going, about, uh, uh, or in terms of increases, uh, $16.5 million more of that increase will go to, the, to Lincoln Public Schools. About $21 million of the increase will go to uh, Omaha Public Schools. So it's your larger school districts in the state that are benefiting from, from the uh, from the bill in the sense of where, where the increased dollars are going to. Right now in this state we have, uh, I think the last figure I heard was 102 non-equalized districts this year. These are districts that are not receiving state equalization aid. Uh, by far the large majority of these districts are your smaller rural districts that are predominantly ag land based districts. Uh, these obviously with the increase in values that we've seen in ag land, they're, they're looking more wealthy in the state aid formula. They've seen uh, student numbers decline or, or, if, if, or they're not increasing, they're stabilizing, but it looks like they have more resources per student, plus it looks like they, uh, they don't, in the formula, they don't have as many needs. So uh, we're having uh, more rural schools lose equalization aid, so it's projected under LB 407 that uh, we'd have 114 non-equalized districts. Here's the crux of the issue. Uh, there, their appropriations committee and others have made it abundantly clear that there's not going to get any more money into the state aid formula, so the $905 million is, is it. Uh, from a rural school standpoint, the, the 407 is not great by any means because we haven't we have continue to see school the number of school districts getting aid erode. But the problem is the, the larger school districts aren't satisfied with 407 and they basically they want more money. 
uh, they're trying they want to try to get another 20 to 25 million dollars in state aid so if you have a capped amount of dollars at 905 million larger schools want another 20 to 25 million that's going to come from somewhere and that's rural schools and the projections show that if they if the larger schools had their wish the number of non-equalized school districts would bump up probably greater than 150, maybe even reach 160 school districts across the state. So the fight's going to be trying to protect LB 407 from any amendments by the larger schools to try to pull more dollars out of that. Uh, I just was at a meeting today with the Nebraska Rural Community Schools Association. That's the, the entity that kind of represents the smaller rural schools. And uh, so we're going to be working with them along with some other ag organizations to try to protect what the the committee did with LB 407 and uh, it's going to be hard because when you look at the number of votes in that body that Omaha and Lincoln have and if they want more money when it comes to raw brute political force they can do it so we'll we'll have our work cut out for you but I think one of the arguments we're going to make when you look at the total number of state aid dollars going to the, to the 20 largest school districts in the state they're going to be getting 80 percent of the state aid but they only have 65 percent of the students and so something's askew there, and, and uh, we, that's hopefully an argument that we can make. But we don't expect uh, this just got out of committee. Uh, it will not come up this week. Likely will not come up next week because we've heard they're going to focus on death penalty next week. So it's there, but they want to get to it before the budget. So we're guessing that it might be the week after when that comes up, right before they get to the budget. So it'll, stay tuned on that. I think that's going to be a big, big issue here the remainder of the session. Just uh, I'll, here's just real quick a list of other issues that are out there. We've talked to you a little, obviously, about the corn checkoff before. LB 354 is prioritized. It has not been on the agenda yet. Uh, I have no word of when it might. The same goes for LB 96, which is the uh, uh, to repeal the repair parts on uh, ag machinery and equipment. That one's kind of caught in the limbo of the tax study and, and, and the tax discussion and the budget discussion and whether or not there will be enough money left over to try to do some things in the way of the tax reform uh, or tax issues. We'll have to see LB 308. I just threw that in there. It's a, it's a bill that came out of the, the Revenue Committee. Uh, it deals with income taxes. One of the things why we're interested in it, it would, uh, it would bring Nebraska laws applies to income taxes and carry loss forward in in line with federal law. Right now, Nebraska only allows you to carry losses uh, five years forward. Federal laws 20 years. This would bring Nebraska law into compliance, or not compliance, but in similar to federal law. And so we have some interest in that. And then obviously, LB 613, the tax study still out there. Those last three bills, I think, of all those tax issues, I think 613 will pass. There seems to be a lot of momentum to, to study our tax issues. I would be, right now, I'd be a little surprised on 96 and 308 just because of uh, some of the budget issues that are out there and some of the other things that are going on. I think the easy answer for senators will be to uh, not do anything on taxes and say we're just going to study it. So, so, sorry, I threw a lot at you there in a little short time, but I just kind of wanted to hit on all the issues that we've been working on the last two or three weeks, kind of give you a rundown on those. And Jay, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody might have. Okay. Are there any questions for... Jay Rempe. Or for Jordan. <laughs> or for Steve. Steve is here too. Oh, well, Larry does have his hand raised, so we're going to try Larry again. I see, I know he got his microphone fixed. He texted me, so. Larry, are you there? Well, I'm here. Are you there? Yes, we can hear you, Larry. <laughs> Good. Uh, a comment on some of the things that Jordan talked about. He talked about uh, a number of things, the, the continuing resolution, the Senate budget, the House budget, the President's budget, and on and on. And I think that points out how important these sessions are to keep us current in what's going on. Uh, certainly, I can't keep up, and I appreciate all the work that uh, Jordan and Jay and, and both Jays and all you guys do back there. So uh, just, just thank you from me. Uh, a comment on 40, LB 407 that uh, Jay Rempe talked about, I think that points out the fallacy of putting so much emphasis on property taxes uh, when we get uh, whipsawed back and forth. We're, we're seeing uh, values go up, taxes then go up, 
uh, even though our county uh, commissioners want to say they, well, I didn't raise taxes, but they still get more money. Um, and I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but uh, I think that points out, again, the fallacy of putting so much emphasis on property taxes. And we need something that is more even uh, and does not swing us so hard one way or the other when we look, about, look at funding issues. Yeah, Larry, this is Jay, and, and first, thank you for your, your comments. Uh, at, uh, we, we're glad that you're getting, getting some use out of these, and, and uh, we certainly encourage feedback from everybody on, on these things. And, uh, we, we appreciate your time you're taking. Uh, you're exactly right on, on the property taxes and the state aid to schools and, and the over-reliance and, and everybody getting website. It uh, One of the things that uh, we're hoping uh, might come out of this tax study, and, and this is an issue that we've been struggling with for, for many years, but uh, there might be some senators that, that were recently elected that uh, bring some new perspective to this, but uh, is our looking at education funding and the over, over-reliance on property taxes and ways to, uh, to, to change that and broaden that a little bit, if you will, and, and to try to, to whipsaw this, because one of the things that that I've talked to a couple senators about is uh, the state is kind of getting by a little bit on the cheap right now in terms of uh, the over-reliance on property taxes and what's happened with ag land in the last five or six years in terms of the valuation growth. If we were to see something change in that regard uh, in the next two or three years uh, and all of a sudden uh, values start going down again, you instead of uh, looking at increases of only 53 million, I shouldn't say only, but 53 six percent increase in state aid from one year to the next, all of a sudden that formula is going to be spitting out a lot larger numbers, and they're going to have a big, big problem on their hands. So you're, you're correct on a lot of fronts there. And we just also had another question come in in regards to uh, the state school boards association and, and where they're at on the state aid bill, and I cannot answer that. I, I do not know where they stand traditionally. State School Board Association has kind of stayed out of the fray on, on state aid issues uh, along with the school administrators because obviously they have members that are part of big schools and, and smaller schools. So what, what we see happening on, on this bill, which is uh, where, and, and, and it's similar to what we've seen in, in other schools or other years, you typically take your Class A schools, your Omaha Lincolns, Grand Islands, those uh, west side up in Omaha, and uh, they're on one side of the issue, and, and obviously rural schools and smaller schools are, are on the different side. What's, what's a little different this year is that uh, in years past, uh, what I call kind of mid, your mid-side schools, like your Ogallalas, maybe your Lexingtons, uh, kind of that, sm that size of community, uh, it's kind of caught in the middle uh, on these issues, but uh, we're getting to the level where if the larger schools are successful in, in going after the additional dollars, it will impact some of those mid-level size schools too, and they'll lose state aid as well and, and potentially be become non-equalized. So uh, it, it's a lot bigger group that it's affecting now than it has in the past. Okay, uh, we do have another question. Um, this also is on the state aid um, and is is there a way for the state to force consolidation on our small rural schools? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. there. I mean, you could have. In fact, there was a, a Senator Roger Werbine several years ago introduced a bill that would have required uh, uh, or consolidated schools, at least the administration of the schools, into one school district per county. And that didn't necessarily mean you're closing schools and school buildings, but as far from an administrative standpoint would have uh, limited it to one school district per county. So uh, schools exist at the pleasure of the legislature, and the legislature can go in and, and any kind of shape or form and, and uh, require that consolidation. Uh, it, it, the, a few years ago, the, the discussion over the, the city or the Omaha public schools and the surrounding community schools uh, is a good evidence of that as well, too. Okay, the next question we have, uh, Rorick Pullman has his hand raised. Um, Rorick, you, your mic is unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jay, uh, just clarification. Uh, 517, you said, had to be done by the end of the year. And then secondly, uh, under 613, is the occupancy tax uh, going to be included in the uh, tax study? Uh, good questions, Rorick. Um, yeah, I'm, let me start with the first one. LB 517, the study or the report uh, that is expected out of that would have to be done by the end of the year. And if let me elaborate on that just a bit because that's gotten to be, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but funding for this task force has gotten to be a bit of an issue. The legislation that came forward from the committee it contained three million dollars for that, and the idea was that uh, that three million dollars would go to, to the Department of Natural Resources to work with the task force, to work with consultants, uh, or the task force and the department together we would hire some consultants to help pull the, all this information together. Uh, there was a little bit of misunderstanding exactly what some people were thinking that they were going to have to go into an in-depth feasibility study of all these projects and potential activities out there and that wasn't the intent. The intent was kind of get a first blush, let's pull this information together, prioritize. And so they're going to cut back a little bit on the dollars. Uh, I think the latest figure is about a million dollars and try to get it done. The goal is to get it done by the end of the year. Uh, and then, Rorick, now I got to talk and I forgot your second. Oh, occupation tax. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would presume this, this, uh, this study is wide open. So any kind of tax, any kind of fee potentially could be discussed and could be part of it. Uh, and, but I, I have not heard occupation taxes in and of themselves be mentioned. With this exception, uh, there are some issues within both City of Omaha and City of Lincoln and, and their use of occupation taxes, and uh, especially as they apply to communications and cell phones and those kind of things. That probably will be a topic, uh, but um, the other side of the natural resources districts and the water funding and that occupation tax, uh, I have not heard of that being part of the discussion, but that doesn't mean it can't be or couldn't be. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions this evening? Okay, I am not seeing any other questions. So, Steve, I'm going to uh, get your mic turned back on. You can uh, wrap things up here if you want. Okay, okay, well, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Jay, and thank you, Jordan, for uh, providing uh, information. I appreciate your comments, Larry, on on uh, the value that we hope that these webinars are providing. Uh, also a reminder uh, that uh, there are action alerts out there. Uh, be sure and respond to those whenever you can. That That is very, very helpful as well. And I believe that we had a record number of attendees on tonight, both, both with individuals, individuals and, and uh, through, the through the county, county board meetings that, that, are, that, that are, are taking place, place and uh, taking part in this webinar. So uh, that's very, very good as well. well. And we're thankful, thanks uh, to everyone for for your participation in that way. Uh, anything else around the table here? I, I'll, I'll turn, turn it back to Jay then probably to close up. up but but, but uh, uh, again, again, thank, thank you very, very much. much. We have uh, not completely decided on whether we will have another webinar uh, during, during the legislative, legislative session. session. We will keep you up, up to date on what, what our plans are there and how things proceed both, both with the legislature and, and in Washington, Washington particularly related to Farm Bill and SPCC. So uh, anyway, anyway uh, anything, anything else, Jay? Jay? Well, Steve, you, you mentioned it, um, and we certainly want to hear from, from you folks on how these are beneficial and and we realize we're coming up to a very busy time of year, and we don't want to take you away from that. Um, but if you are curious about what's going on in the legislature and would like to have another uh, legislative update here between now and I believe the session goes through the end of May, Jay, so you know we can certainly do another one. That is entirely, we're, we're always open to do this. It's entirely up to you. So give us your feedback. Shoot me an email if it's something you'd be interested in and we will certainly get it set up. Uh, we have talked about, uh, kicked around the idea about maybe doing one as a follow-up, as a wrap-up once the session is over. So um, we are certainly 
open for that consideration and would love to hear from you on that. Uh, my plan is to send out an email here in the next week or so and kind of maybe do a survey on uh, any way we can improve this or what you think and then we'll also put a question there if you want us to do another one maybe into May or something as well. So um, with that I would like to thank everybody for being on this evening and the, the county farm bureaus that uh, made this be a part of their meeting and the field staff who are there assisting those county farm bureaus with uh, some technology and and their abilities to do that as well too. Um, so we've had some good uh, good positive comments that have come in here as well too so we thanks for all those as well. So with that, good night everybody. Good evening everyone. Thank <laughs> you.